Welcome to the House at Pooh Corner with Jim Hogue. Your guest today is Robert Bose, and he is a founder of the Public Banking Institute. Uh, we were there at the very beginnings with Ellen Brown when this was all put together. Um, he is also a founder of Colorado Public Banking, as well as a, um, a commentator on political economy on um, Colorado Public Television, or on a blog. Uh, Bob read political science and economics at Stanford during the 1960s while protesting the war in Vietnam. Well, who didn't? Um, he is the author of the Home Rule Charter of the Town of Ward, Colorado, as well as a former producer, writer, director for both Colorado Public Television and Rocky Mountain PBS, a longtime yogi and author of two books, Solomon's Proof, A Psycho-Spiritual Journey to World Consciousness, and Seven Steps to Global Economic and Spiritual Transformation. So, um, for those of you who followed my radio program for 25 years, I did many interviews with the, from people around the world on public money, including Ellen Brown and uh, Zarlinga and um, the, the, whole, the whole gang of people who were working on monetary reform. Uh, I haven't done a, well, we did a couple of programs already on this YouTube channel having to do with public money. And uh, here we are again with one of the leaders in the field. And uh, one of my problems with the Zarlinga people and the, and the modern monetary theory people is they're working on a national and global uh, scale. And when I first got together with Ellen Brown and we were communicating with the, all the people sort of founding who were founding public banking, uh, Ellen and I were more at that point, I think, focusing on the state by state, because I had personally given up on any national movement that, that would work. And so I was trying to do what North Dakota had done in 1919. But let's turn it over to uh, Bob Bose, who will tell us a bit about his involvement in this, and then we can morph into his most recent books, and um, we'll go from there. Great, Jim, thank you. Um, I think that's a really important point, what you were just talking about, the difference between uh, public banks at a state or county or municipal level, as opposed to what that means at a national level. And I do agree with you that uh, the focus, as is the focus of PBI presently, is to work on uh, local public banks and trying to educate that uh, people about what public banking means in that way. The one problem I have with that approach is that we need to educate people as to what a national public bank would mean because it's a whole other ballgame and you have to keep your eyes on the prize and understand how uh, uh, if the Fed, for example, which is still the most important uh, central bank on the planet because uh, Federal Reserve notes constitute about 60% of selected drawing rights. Um, and uh, so it, it is the most traded currency on the planet. About 80% of foreign exchange occurs using Federal Reserve notes. So, um, so it's really important for people to understand the difference between what a central public bank could do versus what all the local ones could do. And of course, the Bank of North Dakota is the best example that we have of a uh, public bank in the United States. And it served North Dakota really well. They run a budget so, uh, surplus. They were the least affected state when the crash came in 2008. They had the lowest unemployment rates. Um, the last time I looked, there were zero bank failures in North Dakota, all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a whole different matter when the central bank becomes a public bank because the central bank is the only bank that can literally create uh, what they call base money, uh, mm -hmm. which is um, sovereign 
uh, currency yeah. in, in whatever country that might happen. And that changes a lot of things. If the Federal Reserve were changed that way, and this was a plank in the original Green New Deal, and what I mean by that is the actual party platform of the Green Party in 2012. Mm -hmm. This Green New Deal that's been introduced in Congress is mm -hmm. pretty much a usurpation of that. It's been severely watered down, and the whole idea, I think, between all of these, quote, progressives in Congress at the present time is to really get real progressives to vote for fake progressives in the Congress uh, where uh, all of these initiatives will go nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I basically, you know, and, and, and of course, then we get into the whole act, act voting process in the United States uh, with electronic voting and counting machines. Um, they're all programmed um, by the folks who manufacture them, uh, who are uh, domestically based. This has nothing to do with the Russians. Um, and so anyway, uh, back to your point, um, you know, it's an important distinction between a national public bank and the local public banks. Uh, but I do agree with you that uh, local is where we need to focus, where you can go look at your um, local officials in the eye and ask them, what side are you on? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the, oh, and we don't have time to go into the, the nature of money too much, but uh, would you agree that even with a state bank, as wonderful as they are, it's what we call pass-through money? It's, it's, you're using the money that the Federal Reserve has created um, so that it's it's not quite the same as public money, but it's still a huge step in the right direction because the state... Right. Can, go ahead. The key thing really is that if you have a, a, a public bank at a state or a county or a municipal level, um, then basically you can take the... Uh, you can leverage um, the tax monies and the fees that you collect you put them into your own bank. Yep. Um, even if you charged yourself uh, interest uh, through financing, um, then that interest comes back to you. Yeah. Uh, so literally, uh, the costs of any capital project uh, through a public bank are literally half of what they would cost you through a privately controlled mm -hmm. bank. So you can either do uh, something at half the cost, or you can do twice as much for mm -hmm. the same price. Yeah. And uh, and that's huge. You can see that how North Dakota has leveraged that whenever some kind of crisis has come up, a flooding or blight or fl uh, fires or anything like that. The Bank of North Dakota steps in uh, much quicker than FEMA, takes care of the issues, suspends mortgages, until uh, the crisis is passed, all sorts of things. So the whole social fabric of the state of North Dakota is much different than many other states. Uh, families have been able to hold on to their farmland and businesses um, instead of having to um, give them up um, because they were collateralized and the big private banks then step in during the crisis and seize those assets. So. Um, uh, so public banking is a major factor, um, and, and it is in my book as well. And I do go, you know, into what I think would be the model of a, uh, and how things would change if the national central bank, you know, if, if the central bank were, were nationalized. Mm -hmm. And one um, thing that we should mention is that, that would change the entire world. Oh yeah. Because of the of the situation of Federal Reserve notes. Yeah. Well, one thing that listeners might want to know is that in 1919, the people of North Dakota created their own state bank because the pressure from the central bank in New York was so great. They had bought up the railroads, essentially, the grange, and the mortgages on the farms. So the farmers were slaves to the uh, great sucking sound of everything they did, having to pay their share to the 
which ended up with the central banks. So when North Dakota formed the Nonpartisan League, they swept everybody out of the legislature. They, they had a new governor, a new lieutenant governor. Everything was fresh. And uh, Wall Street went bazonkers. They tried to get the Supreme Court to stop them, but there was there's nothing in the Constitution in, in any way that would stop a state from forming a state bank. There's, of course, a prohibition against um, bills of credit. But what they meant by bills of credit then is we won't get into now. But anyway, so that's the history of the Bank of North Dakota, where had they not done that, they, they all would have lost their farms. Absolutely. Um, they were losing their farms at the time. And of course, um, the privately controlled central banks, which I generally refer to as the Anglo-Euro-American banking cartel, mm -hmm. um, they have fought public banks since the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been a few nations that have their own central banks, Canada and Australia included, um, as well as other central banks around the world. They're always under pressure and under attack and under attack. And I dare say that the public banking movement in uh, the United States, um, many, many states, well over 20 states at this time, a whole number of cities, uh, those, uh, the folks that are deciding these things are basically under a lot of pressure from the cartel um, to, you know, try to prevent this. You know, there was a recent success um, in American Samoa uh, mm -hmm. But, of course, the reason that the cartel let that happen is there just literally were no banks on the island. And so the only way they could get a bank was forming a public bank. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that is a new public bank uh, within the U.S. empire. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's still a notable success. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they'll be under a lot of pressure. Um uh, and that's how that's how public banking gets disturbed is um, somehow there's some sort of infiltration into the system and then they end up buying toxic act, act toxic yeah. assets. Mm -hmm. um, that's what they did to the world's oldest public bank um, in Italy a few years back, and that's how they brought that one down. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned uh, Canada and Australia. I don't think listeners realize that they ha they used to have real public banks, but they were their arms were twisted, and they gave that up. I forget the dates when that happened, but both Canada and Australia uh, had the pressure from the Anglo, from from um, the city in in London, etc., and they for for some reason caved in. Yeah. Well, it's fairly common um, through uh, muscle and uh, bribery mm -hmm. uh, that the parliaments and congresses uh, come under a lot of pressure. It's happened in the United States um, uh, really since the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. On my blog, uh, coloradopublicbanking.blogspot.com, um, I post my articles there. and. Um, one of my articles is really a history of the United States through the lens of banking and, uh, and how the uh, banking cartel has basically usurped um, and now controls the United States government. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that came through uh, control of the Congress over and over again. Right from the beginning, really, the first bank of the United States proposed by Hamilton, you know, now we have all this fake news coming out. He gets a, uh, uh, a flashy musical um, that makes him out to be something entirely different than he, than he is uh, or was. Um, you know, it was funny. Uh, my political advisor um, at Stanford, I got in touch with him recently when my book came out. He's 90 years old now, and we were discussing all sorts of things. And then uh, we got on the on the subject of Hamilton and the musical, and he was just livid, saying, "You know, they should have, they should have made this musical about Jefferson, not Hamilton." Um, and I thought that was, 
you know, funny just coming from him yeah. uh, that we share the same perspective on the uh, on the musical. And of course, um, a number of years before that musical, they did one on Andrew Jackson to denigrate him um, for the same reason. They want to get him off the currency because he was opposed to the private central banks. And of course, yeah. Hamilton was their guy. Well, and there were several attempts to assassinate Jackson that failed, and history in informs me that it had to do with his antagonism toward the central banks in New York. And then uh, Lincoln and Lincoln trumped that. But back to Hamilton, um, there are arguments as to whether or not his American banking system that he created was um, sort of led the way for, the, again, the Anglo empire to come right back in and control American financing because it was a similar system. Some people think, oh, no, the, this Hamiltonian system of, of banking, had it been maintained purely, it, it would have been great. I, I lean, I'm more suspicious of what Hamilton was up to uh, because Jefferson and, uh, and uh, Franklin and, of course, Thomas Paine were very much against that kind of federalist taking over of the money system because he who controls, he who creates the money is the sovereign. And so if you allow yeah. a bank to create the money, the bank becomes the sovereign. Well, you need look no further than who owned the, the first and second banks of the United States mm -hmm. um, to settle that question. Um, and uh, indeed, the first bank of the United States, um, the Anglo-Euro-American Banking Cartel, the city of London, the private financial district uh, in London, um, uh, held a major stake and then uh, forced the United States uh, to borrow um, to, um, su to su uh, bolster its navy because mm -hmm. um, they were attacking, um, uh, well, that was after the first bank. That's why the second bank came into existence. But anyway, the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, British bankers ended up controlling the first bank of the United States and the second bank of the United States. States. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when um, Madison refused to renew uh, the charter of the first bank, that what precipitated the War of 1812. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when Jackson refused um, in the wake of the United States accepting the second bank because um, it needed to fund its navy mm -hmm. because the British and the Barbary pirates yes. were attacking you know, attacking trade, um, then, uh, then all of those assassination attempts at Jackson occurred, occurred after that. Um, Taylor um, opposed the central bank, um, former general, then president of the mm -hmm. United States. He was poisoned. Um, of course, Lincoln actually printed greenbacks, to, uh, which were a sovereign U.S. Yeah. currency um, issued without debt. And, um, and we know what happened with him. Um, and he, as he was planning on, um, in 1863 and 1864, the, the National Banking Acts were passed. Mm -hmm. The cartel uh, managed to bribe the Congress into doing this. <clears throat> so they stopped printing greenbacks and forced the United States government to use private banknotes again, to which um, the taxpayers had to pay <clears throat> principal interest. Mm -hmm. Um, Lincoln was going to try to overturn that. That's why they got rid of him. Um, you know, and it, it just goes on and on until they uh, got the Federal Reserve Act passed. Well, one uh, yeah. bit of history that I, I think is good to interject here is that the stories as to why the War of Independence had to be fought in the first place I, I don't agree with the emphasis. I, I, I don't deny that all these other things that people talk about were factors. But they don't tend to talk about the Currency Act. And in my opinion, and Ellen Brown's opinion, the, the Currency Act was arguably the most important thing that Britain did in order to completely regain control over the colonies and back to what I said before, if you create the money, you're the sovereign. And the, the British bankers knew that, 
And so the War of Independence became necessary because the Brits prevented the Americans from creating their own currency. And then it followed right up with the War of 1812 when they tried it again. And you would think that, the, uh, that American politicians would have had enough revolutionary spirit in them to understand that, but I'm afraid they didn't. I mean, I don't really think they got what it meant to let the Brits take control over the currency. And then I'm sure you've read that wonderful, I don't know if it's in Ellen's book or not, the um, flipping out of the British bankers when Lincoln created the, the greenbacks. It was Chase, right, was behind it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I totally, in fact, Franklin um, agrees with you. Yes, I read the whole, yeah. And he was pretty explicit that um, because it was really something that uh, that the Brits got tipped off to by Franklin's visits to London, mm -hmm. you know, uh, when they asked him uh, how they dealt with poverty in the colonies, and Franklin said, well, we don't have any. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they said, well, how is that possible? And he said, well, each, uh, each colony prints its own money, and so we keep uh, the right amount in circulation to match the goods and uh, services yeah. um, being traded. And, um, and so that's when that Currency Act, the British bankers got Parliament to pass the Currency Act, which banned paper money in uh, America. And Franklin said that was the principal reason for the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, yeah, it's been a, uh, I think the problem is, and, and is that um, um, even though there were a number of Congress people that understood the money situation, I mean, obviously Jefferson came to understand it, Madison, Franklin, all of this, um, the, when somebody puts a gun to your head and threatens you or your family and then gives you a little money, um, that changes things. So I don't really denigrate anybody that gets put in that position. I, it's not for me to judge mm -hmm. them uh, when they're threatened like that. But this this continually goes on. Uh, we can see it today. It's the same thing. Oh yeah, and we you know. we were getting pretty far along in Vermont. I mean, we we had six to one vote in one committee and five to nothing, as I recall, in another. And then the chair of that committee refused, had a gun to his head, he didn't pass it on to the appropriations or finance. I, you know, it was, it was like f four, five years ago, but uh, that that happened here as well. Yeah, I remember that. And, and we see it happening all over the country, the same thing. Uh, people get really excited about this. Santa Fe is another good mm -hmm. example of that, where they were ready to implement this, and then all of a sudden something happened. Yeah. Um, the other aspect, too, like we saw in Los Angeles, and, um, and what I tell people is, you know, if you don't put some of your campaign money into independent exit polls, you'll have no proof um, as to, you know, the red flags, the more than 2% difference between the exit polls and the final results mm -hmm. to show that the uh, election um, voting that um, is reported um, is actually inaccurate and, and has been hacked. So uh, I think either people don't get this or, um, you know, or maybe there's a part of the movement um, that's been uh, become useful opposition. Yeah. You know, um, and I think I think we see that in the Congress now where we have, um, you know, we've had these uh, five progressives mm -hmm. that were appointed, <clears throat> you know, and everybody's all so excited about um, all of them. Uh, but, you know, that, that won't go anywhere. Uh, I think, in, in my personal opinion, I think what happened was in 2016, um, Jill Stein got way, way, way more votes than were reported. And so, um, uh, in their inimitable and wise, I mean, you know, the cartel uh, tries to hire the best and the brightest and all of that. Um, I don't know that that's really true of them, but there's a lot of smart people working for them. And so one of the things they've always done is 
um, you know, create a, um, a voice for progressive ideas to get real progressives to vote for people in the blue party mm -hmm. uh, where this all goes to die. Okay. And um, <clears throat> we've only got about a minute. We've only got about a minute. Oh, by the way, I wrote the bill preventing electronic voting in Vermont, which passed like that. So that's something that happened that was good. But tell us about your book again, and, uh, and we'll okay. set up another interview. Okay. So my book is called Seven Steps to Global Economic and Spiritual Transformation. It's available um, under my, my name, Robert Bowes, on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. Um, you can also find a link to it on my website, coloradopublicbanking.blogspot.com. And uh, there's a lot of articles. I, I continue to pump out articles on timely topics there as well. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's good for everybody to know. And um, you lay out the seven points that you think countries around the world should look at in order to get their way out of, uh, among other things, the debt-based money system. Of course, the whole, yes. East, the whole Middle East did that, and look what happened to them. I right. Mean, so the whole point is just here's, here's a bunch of things that we need to understand and know before we tackle this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, otherwise, we'll, we'll spend a lot of our time doing things that won't get us anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it... Where, look where it got Syria and, and Iraq and, and Libya and the seven countries that Wesley Clark predicted. Um, they the had sovereign money. Destroyed since 9 11, um, controlled their own central bank and currency. And currently there's five left Iran, Syria, North Korea, Cuba, and Sudan. And they're all in the crosshairs. So, you know, that's definitely the agenda. Everything else is smoke and mirrors, mm -hmm. um, including oil. Uh, that's just a secondary issue. Mm -hmm. It's the, the dollar is based on it now in the, in the sense of gunboat diplomacy. But that's another issue, too. Well, we've got so much more to talk about. Hopefully we'll set up another interview and maybe Ellen will join us. That would be great, Jim. Yeah. I really appreciate you asking me on, and I'd be happy to spend time talking with you and Ellen as well. Okay, so the uh, this has been Robert Bowes. The program is called The House at Pooh Corner with Jim Hogue, and it will be on three different uh, channels on YouTube, and I hope you all enjoy it and get the book by Robert Bowes. Thank you.